If you're preparing for the Florida Civics Literacy Exam or the FCLE, welcome, you've come to the right channel. In this video, we're going to break down and answer multiple FCLE practice test questions from six separate FCLE practice tests. If that sounds good to you, let's get rolling. All right, so let's get rolling with three practice questions from competency one. Number one says, who proposed that individuals enter into a social contract to form a government? So you have options here. You have Montesquieu, Locke, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. So when we're talking about the social contract, we're really talking about the Enlightenment. Only two of these options represent the Enlightenment thinkers that kind of influenced American government, which are A and B. So between John Locke and Montesquieu. So John Locke is most famous for his ideas on natural rights, but also the social contract meaning you give up some protections in order for the government to protect you. So I always use this example in my classroom. I can't go around and punch people in the face, right? Why not? Because the government exists to protect me from being punched in the face. I give up my right to go out and punch people to be protected from being punched myself. The answer here is B. Number two, according to John Locke, where does the legitimacy of political authority come from? A is divine right, B is the military, C is the consent of the governed, and D is a hereditary monarchy. So John Locke was not a fan of monarchies, so we can immediately get rid of B. Divine right, not necessarily divine meaning holy, not necessarily what he was thinking here. B the military, absolutely not. He was not thinking in those terms whatsoever. So C is going to be the correct answer here, the consent of the governed. In America, we have this idea of popular sovereignty, meaning the power of government comes from the people. All this kind of ties into to the consent of the governed in the following ways. So what the consent of the governed is, is the people that are actually going to follow the rules, accept the rules that are going to be put in, in front of them, right? So they elect officials. Those officials are going to, you know, make rules that the population has to follow, all right? So the consent, meaning the approval of those who are going to be governed by the rules that are put in, in front of them. Three, why is citizens' active participation and agreement with the government's actions crucial for its legitimacy and functioning? So A says to ensure military support, B, it guarantees economic stability, C, it reflects the concepts of the social contract, and D, hereditary monarchy. So nothing really about the military here. Guaranteeing economic stability, maybe. If people follow the rules, maybe the economy can function better. A hereditary monarchy really has nothing to do with this question. So really between B and C here. And C says it reflects the concept of the social contract. Now, let's read the question again. Citizens' active participation and agreement with government actions. This is quintessentially the idea of the social contract. People give up some rights to the government in order for the government to protect them. The answer here is C. All right, so let's move into competency two and take a look at three more practice test questions. Number four says, what branch of government does the Article Three establish? So you have the legislative, executive, judicial, and state governments. Well, D is not a branch of government, so you can immediately get rid of D. So your, your answer choices are A, B, and C, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. So Article One establishes the legislative branch, Article Two establishes the executive branch, and then Article Three represents the judicial branch. So the, the answer to number four is going to be C, judicial branch. Now, one way to remember this is L-E-J, so ledge, or, you know, L-E-J. It's the best way that I can think of to remember the order in which the articles are constructed in the Constitution. You can also think about the different powers that the branches have. So people would argue that the legislative has the most power in government, so obviously they're going to be Article 1. You'd say maybe the executive has the second most power, Article 2. And then you definitely know that judicial has the least amount of power in terms of proactively addressing government issues, so they will be the third article. Number five, what is the primary role of the judicial branch as outlined in Article 3? So we just spoke in the previous question that Article 3 is going to highlight the judicial branch, but what does that actually mean in terms of its role of government? So A, you have enforcing laws, B, you have making, C, you have interpreting laws, and then D, you have amending laws. So enforcing laws belongs to the executive branch, E, enforce, E, executive. Making laws belongs to the legislative branch, that is their primary job, Interpreting laws is going to be the responsibility of the judicial branch, all right? So the judicial branch is going to have the predominant job of interpreting laws. They basically decide whether or not laws are constitutional or unconstitutional, okay? They interpret them. They don't make them, they don't enforce them, but they do look at the laws and decide whether or not those fit into the scope of the Constitution itself. Number six, according to Article 3, what types of cases are federal courts authorized to hear? 
A. Cases involving state laws. B. Cases involving foreign governments. C. Cases involving local disputes. Or D. Cases involving city ordinances. So you can immediately put C and D in the same category here. All right, so involving local disputes and involving uh, city ordinances. Ordinances are city laws, and then local disputes happen within a city. So you can immediately take uh, C and D and put them to the side. Now you have options of A and B, cases involving state law, and then B, cases involving foreign governments. So federal courts are not authorized to hear any state matter. We have a federalist system in the United States, meaning that power is shared and divided between a federal and a state government. State courts take care of state issues. The answer here is going to be B. Cases involving foreign governments are going to be addressed by the federal government. That makes sense. North Carolina or Florida or New York isn't going to have a say or the, the authority to hear a case that has to deal with a French diplomat. That makes zero sense. What does make sense is the United States having the ability to do that. The answer here is going to be B. If you like what you're seeing so far, you can download the full version of all six of these FCLE practice tests on our website at govdogs.com. Just go ahead and follow the link in the description. Stay tuned till the end of this video for $10 off our practice test bundle. So we're actually going to address four questions in competency three. Let's get rolling on number seven. Seven says, what state's constitution served as a model for other state constitutions and the U.S. Constitution? A is New York, B is Massachusetts, C is Hawaii, and D is Pennsylvania. So C, you can immediately get rid of because Hawaii was not a state at this time or even a colony. Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts. Answer going to be B, Massachusetts. This is one of those that you kind of either know it or you don't. Massachusetts state constitution was definitely one of the ones that was the most influential in the drafting of the federal constitution as we know it. So you just kind of need to know this one, B, Massachusetts. Eight, what did the Articles of Confederation primarily emphasize? So there were multiple issues with the Articles of Confederation that led to the eventual drafting of the U.S. Constitution. So A says a strong federal government, B says the sovereignty of individual states, C says the monarchy, and D says theocracy. So monarchy and theocracy are forms of government. This doesn't really necessarily uh, relate to a confederation in any regard. So you can go ahead and get rid of C and D as answer choices. A, a strong federal government, or B, the sovereignty of individual states, which is another way of saying strong state governments. So one of the glaring issues with the Articles of Confederation is that state governments had way too much power. You have to think historically about the reasoning behind them. We just became independent from England, which had a very authoritarian and oppressive central government. So when the Articles were drafted, the state governments retained a lot of the power because of their experience having a government with a very strong central power. So one of the biggest downfalls of the Articles of Confederation was an imbalance between state and, and federal power. The answer here is going to be B. The sovereignty of individual states was definitely emphasized when drafting the Articles of Confederation. Continuing our discussion on the Articles of Confederation, let's take a look at number nine. Nine says, what significant weakness of the Articles of Confederation led to the call for the Constitutional Convention? A. Lack of taxation. B. Overreach of the central government. C. Absence of a standing army. D. Excessive state sovereignty. So, lack of taxation, definitely an issue. All right, that was definitely one of the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Remember, we talked about how strong the states were. That meant that the federal government was weaker and couldn't collect tax revenue. If you know anything about governments, taxes are necessary for a government to function. B is overreaching of central power. We just talked about how under the Articles of Confederation, the federal government really didn't have too much power, so you can get rid of B. C is the absence of a standing army, not necessarily. And then D, excessive state sovereignty. So I would put your answer choices between A and D. So yes, state sovereignty was definitely a major issue under the Articles of Confederation, but really the biggest catalyst for the Constitutional Convention was A, the lack of taxation power. The federal government couldn't collect tax revenue because they couldn't collect tax revenue, they couldn't function properly. This was the biggest catalyst for the Constitutional Convention. 10, what did the Northwest Ordinance do? So the orderly expansion of nation's territories, established a monarchy, expansion of slavery, or the imposition of religious dogma. So you, B, C, and D, you have monarchy, slavery, and religion. This has nothing to do with the Northwest Ordinance, all right? An ordinance is another word for a law, like we talked about previously. So the answer is A, the order of expansion of the nation's territories. So the purpose of the Northwest Ordinance was to be able to add territory to the Union without having major conflict or confusion. This was actually one of the only successes under the Articles of Confederation. So the answer to 10 is A. 
I just have to talk about some important Supreme Court legislation or landmark Supreme Court cases like we say in the history world. All right, so the biggest thing that you need to understand about Supreme Court cases are the argument, the so what, which is basically the impact on the nation and the decision. So one through three, we're gonna talk about three separate court cases here. One is Marbury versus Madison, one is McCullough versus Maryland, and the other is Dred Scott versus Sanford. And again, the importance here is going to be the argument, the decision, and the so what. So when you're reviewing these specific landmark Supreme Court cases, that's what I would focus on. The other stuff is not necessarily that important. The argument is, the decision is, and the so what is. Number one says, which principle did Marbury versus Madison establish? What you need to know about Marbury versus Madison is that it establishes judicial review, all right? What judicial review is, is the Supreme Court's ability to review whether or not something is constitutional or unconstitutional. This could be acts by a president. This could be pieces of legislation that are passed. But the, the important thing that you need to realize about Marbury versus Madison is the concept of judicial review. The answer here is going to be B. Two, what did McCullough versus Maryland affirm? So you have the power of the states to tax the federal government. You have the principle of implied powers and the constitutionality of a national bank. You have the ability or the authority of Congress to regulate commercial, commerce between states. And you have the authority of states to nullify federal law. So B or so A and D are talking about states overriding federal power. You can immediately get rid of that because of the supremacy clause. The states cannot override federal power. A and D are not going to be correct. So that leaves you with B and C. This again, you need to know the so what about each of these landmark Supreme Court cases. The answer is B, the principle of implied powers and the constitutionality of the national bank. What implied powers are, they are not necessarily listed in the Constitution, but they are necessary in order for the government to carry out their enumerated or expressed powers. So for, for instance, right, an expressed power would be the ability to raise a standing army, but it doesn't say anything in the Constitution about aircraft carriers and rocket launchers. But it's implied in order to develop a standing army, you're going to need things like aircraft carriers and rocket launchers. So implied powers help the federal government carry out their expressed powers. The answer here is B. Three, what did Dred Scott versus Sanford decide regarding African Americans? Again, you're going to need to know the so what. So A says they were granted full citizenship. B, they were considered citizens. C, they were denied citizenship. And then D, they had, to write, had the right to vote in all states. So A, B, and D are connected in the following way. As A says they were citizens, B says they were citizens, B says they had the right to vote, which implies that they are citizens. So you either have three answer choices that tell me that they are citizens, or one answer choice that tells me that they aren't. Dred Scott, they were actually denied citizenship under the Constitution. The answer is C. Before we get into the next competency, if you're enjoying this video, please go ahead and give it a like and consider subscribing. I put a lot of effort into these videos, and it helps the channel when you engage. Thank you. Let's get into our conversation about landmark legislation. Number five, what was the main goal of various civil rights acts between the 19th and 21st centuries? A says protect and expand civil rights, B says to limit civil rights, C says national religion, and D says uh, restricting freedom of speech. So religion and freedom of speech have nothing to do with the Civil Rights Act directly. So you have options here, A or B. Is to protect and expand rights or B to limit rights? The answer is going to be A. The purpose of the Civil Rights Act was to expand rights for marginalized or minority groups in America. Six, how did the US Patriot Act of 2001 impact government surveillance? A says it decreased government surveillance, B says it has no effect, C says it expanded, or D says it abolishes. So A says it gets rid of it, D says it gets rid of it. B says it was neutral, it had no effect, and then C had it expanded government surveillance. The answer to number six is C. The Patriot Act did actually expand surveillance powers of the federal government, leveraging the events of 9-11 to be able to kind of spy on foreign and domestic citizens as well. So seven says, which president's initiatives led to the Great Society in the 1960s? So only two people were president during the 1960s. Abraham Lincoln was not one of them. FDR or Franklin wrote or Franklin Roosevelt was not one of them either. So you have LBJ or JFK. The answer here is C, it's going to be Lyndon B. Johnson. The Great Society was one of his biggest acts as the president. So make sure that you know that that is associated with LBJ and not JFK. Let's take a look at some landmark executive actions. Number eight says, what did LBJ's executive order require federal contractors to do? A says to implement affirmative action, 
B is segregate the workplace. C is eliminate civil rights. And then D is hire only white employees. So whenever you think about LBJ, think about the great society, also think about affirmative action. The answer here is A, B, C, and D are actually more segregationist policies that LBJ was not a fan of. Nine, what does the bully pulpit refer to? A, the presidential press conference, the presidential uses of their opinion to advance policies, the president's personal retreat, or a special type of speech given by the president. Yes, a lot of times when you think about the bully pulpit, it has stuff to do, or it has to do with speeches, but this isn't necessarily what it means. So B is going to be the correct answer, the, pres uh, the president's use of their position to advocate for policies. The president has a very forward-facing and direct job in, in front of the American people. He can use that to leverage Congress to make decisions. He can use that to use his power of the executive action to make decisions. So the bully pulpit really just refers to the president's ability to use their power to get their agenda pushed through. Ten, what constitutional authority allows the president to make critical military decisions during conflicts? All right, so A is the first, B is the second, C is the tenth, and D is the president's role as commander-in-chief. So this has nothing to do with the Bill of Rights, so you can get rid of A, B, and C. The answer here is D. The president's role as commander-in-chief allows him to make chief military decisions on behalf of the U.S. military. I hope you enjoyed today's FCLE practice test review. Please use code FCLE10 to unlock $10 off our FCLE practice test bundle. The link is in the description. If you'd like to see similar videos from us, go ahead and comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Also, check out our videos on the five tips for FCLE success and our FCLE masterclass if you haven't done so already. Good luck on your FCLE, and I'll see you soon.